All right. Thank you very much, Bas and Safan, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, speaking at the ISAM platform is always a great pleasure and a great, honor. and I'm really very grateful to the society for uh, uh, for providing this platform to all of us. It is really wonderful to be uh, speaking over here, and. Uh, uh, notwithstanding the generous introduction which uh, Bhas has given, uh, I will make an attempt to uh, share what little I know about um, a very exciting topic uh, this afternoon, time and time delay in atomic dynamics. But before we dive into the topic, I will like to join hands with the scientists all over the world uh, to register our solidarity uh, with respect to eliminating racism. In the last two, three days, uh, scientists all over the world have come together. They have stopped everything else and joined hands for this. And one of the remarks which I came across in this context is, uh, unless you engage directly with eliminating racism, you are perpetuating it. And I liked it very much. And in particular, in India, we have similar issues, discrimination based on caste, gender, lingual, or other groups. And I think it is, it is important not to deny and proactively eliminate all kinds of discrimination. So essentially, I would like to thank the um, uh, Indian Society for Atomic and Molecular Physics once again to um, provide me with this platform to uh, deliver the first web colloquium uh, of the society. And uh, Aditya, Safan, Bhas, you know, all of you, um, I'm really very grateful to you. So uh, time is a very mysterious um, property. And we work with it. Uh, as if, you know, it is something which we are very familiar with. So what, I'm, uh, what I've learned about it is what I've learned from the, my students and collaborators, and I would like to uh, mention them at the outset. They are the, uh, the real contributors to what, what I've compiled to today. Ankur, Somaji, Saurav, Arti, Jobin, Hari, Ashish, Steve Manson, Kaifetz, Dolmatov, and many others. And um, uh, this is now very important for, uh, ultra, for studying ultra-fast uh, atomic dynamics. And uh, Saurav has even helped me with uh, the preparation of some of the slides uh, for today's talk. So our first reconciliation with, you know, time being very mysterious in a, in a major way came with um, the symmetry in Maxwell's equation, which eventually led to the understanding that the speed of light is constant and speed being distance over time, if speed is constant, then distance cannot be constant. And that leads us to the Lorentz contraction and time cannot be constant. That leads us to time dilation. So this symmetry becomes a, a, one of the cornerstones of uh, modern physics and um, Noether, of course, uh, um, it, it, it is best celebrated in Noether's uh, theorems. Then there are, uh, this consequence of symmetry continues because, you know, uh, there is this equivalence uh, between gravity and uh, accelerated frames of references. And that, uh, that causes light to actually bend under gravity. So it, it, the, the phenomenon is so mysterious and now the technology and the hats off to the experimental scientists uh, in the world who have done excellent work and one can actually measure these things and time which is so mysterious that um, you know, means the, the, the way even gravity affects time, your head ages faster than your, than, than your feet. And it is very difficult to really understand what uh, time really is. 
and the way it responds to gravity uh, you can see uh, from these outstanding achievements of experimental physicists you have a fermi degenerate uh, optical lattice clock and it can actually measure the gravitational shift if you just raise the clock by just two centimeters on the earth's surface you take an atom this clock and just raise it through two centimeters and you you can see how the uh, time shift takes place due to the uh, uh, due to this phenomenology and what is present to one is past for another and future for someone else and to us working in the field of atomic and uh, molecular sciences what makes time particularly mysterious is how it appears in the uncertainty principle so you have this uncertainty principle which i always uh, restate as a dog does not bark and bite at the same time so you have this delta q delta p greater than or equal to h cross over 2 and everybody knows what delta q and delta p stands for and there is a similar relationship which is delta e delta t involving energy and time what i want to highlight is that yes it is similar but then it is also not similar because if you remember if you remind yourself as to how you got this expression and and um, you know it, it it is very nicely done in books like sakurai's quantum mechanics and so on you have an operator for position you have an operator for momentum in quantum mechanics and then you work with Uh, Schwarz inequality and so on, and then eventually arrive at this this uncertainty uncertainty relation, and you cannot do the same with uncertainty relation with regard to energy and time because there is no operator for time, there is no operator for time. Whereas over here you work with Hermitian operators, the position and momentum, and and you you can follow the treatment as it is very nicely done in sakurai's book and get the uncertainty relation for position and momentum and energy and time are similar in many ways in classical physics these are canonically conjugate variables the other difference is that um energy can have discrete states and has a lower bound and um th this also makes uh the energy time uncertainty very peculiar so now the question comes as to uh, the, the the question we are working with is the time is really not an observable you do not have a hermitian operator uh corresponding to this and you do not treat it as an observable in quantum mechanics but we all know that yes as bas was saying i have aged and uh, we have a certain sense of uh, time and uh, most of us work in collision physics uh, at one level or the other and we know that if you have an incoming beam of particles which interacts with a target potential then what the potential does is to introduce a phase shift so you may have a repulsive potential or an attractive potential in which case uh the wave uh, which you are eventually pulled in by the potential so this is something that we know and we consider a scattering experiment of this kind that you have got a target potential you have got an incoming beam of mono energetic particles and these particles will get scattered in all all kinds of uh all kinds of uh, directions and you can detect the scattered particle by having a detector which is this i it is in three dimensions it could be behind the screen or in front of it and then it may be in all different directions and scattering may in general be isotropic uh or uh, it it, it it may be isotropic in some cases but more generally it is anisotropic in three dimensions and this is the kind of situation that we are looking at and you can think about it in terms of a cartesian coordinate geometry uh, x y and z but it is easier to do this analysis in spherical polar coordinates 
uh, r theta and phi and in this coordinate system you have an incident beam of particles which comes as a wave packet okay you 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 essentially have a wave packet which comes and hits the target and gets scattered and then of course it has got an angular dependence of the scattered the, 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 we, we can study the um, angle dependence of the scattered waves through the spherical harmonics but uh, we are going to focus our attention on the radial part angular part can be taken care of using the spherical harmonics and on the radial line so you have now projected the three-dimensional problem on a one dimension you have reduced the three-dimensional problem to a one-dimensional radial Schrodinger equation so obviously you will have the centrifugal barrier potential and so on and now after scattering you have the wave packet which leaves the scattering center and moves away from the scattering center along the radial direction so this is the phenomenon which is taking place however what the the tar what, what the projectile wave packet is going to do is to get to find itself engaged with the target potential for a certain while and it is this which causes a certain delay and it is this which we call as time delay this is what is observable time itself is not and i'm going to spend some time discussing uh, the time delay which is an observable so time delay comes into play because the wave packet uh, engages itself in the region of the target potential for a certain amount of time and as a result of which if if it is delayed then on the radial uh, axis it might appear it, it might appear as if the the wave packet originated not closer to the target but somewhat farther away from the target so that is the time delay that we are talking about and this delay has taken place because of the engagement of the wave packet in the uh, scattering zone it is also possible that the wave packet is pushed away by the scattering potential and it might appear to have advanced in other words the time delay can be both positive and negative for this reason so dep depending on whether uh, it appears that the wave packet has been um, uh, engaged or uh, pushed out uh, quicker than a free electron wave packet so this is the time delay or it can also be time advancement because it can have both a positive and a negative sign so essentially the wave packet would have begun its journey at this point r0 which is this black um, point over here but then when you detect it it might appear as if it has started out from this blue point if there is a delay or from this red point if there is advancement so essentially what the wave packet does it travels at a group velocity which is this d omega by dk and this derivative is about a certain mean momentum of the um, free particle uh, wave packet it doesn't have to be electron i've just considered electron for the sake of discussion but it could be uh, whatever um, is the projectile so the analysis that i'm discussing is due to um, wigner eisenberg and uh, Smith, there are a few other contributors also of importance. Uh, Eisenbud was a student of uh, Wigner and uh, many of you uh, are familiar with uh, uh, wigner Eisenbud uh, R matrix theory. So uh, one of the earliest papers in this, uh, the earliest work was due to uh, Eisenbud in his uh, uh, PhD thesis in 1948 and then there is a very uh, important paper by Wigner in 1955 physical review uh, but I will also talk about Smith's uh, contribution to this so this is the time delay and time advancement we now recognize that it can both be uh, positive and negative and the wave packet appears to have originated at a slightly shifted point and this shift in point is this r0 
plus or minus uh, twice um, the derivative of the phase with respect to the momentum. So this, instead of originating from R0, it has now, it, it appears to the detector that it has originated either from this, this blue R0 prime or from this red R0 prime, depending on the delay being positive or negative. And this two delta is coming from the usual scattering analysis. Everybody is familiar with the facts and Holtzmark equation. And essentially the time delay would then be given by the shift, which is this, which I just now pointed out. So this shift divided by the group velocity would be the time delay. And you can now use this expression and use the group velocity and see immediately that there is a time delay. I call it as the Eisenwood Wigner time delay. And this is twice H cross D delta by DE. And the plus or minus sign is coming from here because it might appear that the wave packet originated either from this blue point or from this red point, depending on the nature of the interaction. So it can be either a positive or negative time delay. So this is the Eisenwood Wigner time delay. Remember that you really have to work with wave packets and uh, uh, this whole analysis should be done with a superposition of wave packets because you never have a strictly mono energetic uh, beam of incident waves. There is always a little bit of spread and one should do this analysis and there is therefore essentially a dependence with respect to the momentum because uh, the incident wave packet is not just a single momentum wave packet, but it has got a little bit of spread over, it can be narrow, but it cannot be zero. So this is the wigner eisenberg time delay and considering the wave packet uh, spread, you, the, the, this analysis that we just now expressed end, ends up with uh, this general expression for the wigner eisenberg time delay. And in the partial wave analysis, it would be different in general for each lth partial wave. And you write it as uh, with a superscript L or that is just a matter of uh, notation, but this is the phase shift in the lth partial wave whose energy derivative um, uh, twice in units of H cross, uh, twice because there, are, there is a phase shift when the wave packet approaches the target and then when the wave park packet recedes from the uh, target. So that is what is essentially goes into this factor of two over here. And it's important to keep that in mind because I'm going to come back to this point a little later in this talk. So you have a very nice analysis of the time delay in the uh, brilliant work of uh, Felix Smith in 1960. Uh, he was interested in understanding this lifetime matrix in collision theory. And he, he wanted to understand this average time spent by the particle in the interaction zone. Now the interaction zone is something that um, is easy to understand if it were to have uh, very sharp boundaries, which we know it uh, does not. So Smith developed his formalism in terms of the excess number of particles near the scattering center. So if there is a delay, it would also result in a corresponding excess number of particles in the scattering center this is excess with respect to the free particles. So free particles in, would, would, would be uh, what you would have if there was no target potential. So if the potential was zero, then you're comparing your phase shift with respect to the uh, wave packet of uh, free particles, which are not interacting with any target. And uh, Smith's interpretation of time delay, therefore was in terms of this excess number of particles near the scattering center per unit um, incident or uh, outgoing flux, which is of course conserved. Uh, and uh, uh, that conservation is what leads you to the unitarity of the S matrix. 
So I, I will uh, not go through any detailed uh, mathematical analysis, but I certainly want to um, make you familiar. It means, of course, there are experts over here who know everything about everything. But then uh, there are some graduate students and some uh, younger students who are uh, starting their research in atomic physics. And I will share a few important points with them that you are now looking at the radial part of the uh, Schrodinger equation and the scattering solution. The angular part is well taken care of by the spherical harmonics. And uh, it is easier to write the differential equation in terms of um, this u instead of the radial function capital R, which is just proportional to this. And you know that the free particle uh, solution uh, if you have uh, L equal to zero for S wave, uh, S waves, then you have this e to the plus or minus IKR uh, solutions, where, which are the spherical ingoing and outgoing waves. And the general solution would be a superposition of a complete set of bases. You can use any basis states, but then uh, the spherical ingoing and outgoing is a nice uh, pair. You can use uh, other base pairs, of course. Uh, sine and cosine if you wish. And the excess density that I commented uh, coming from Smith's analysis is then given by, if you use this radial function and uh, carry out this analysis, you can get this expression for the time delay, which I call as tau Smith. So this is the time delay from Smith's interpretation it is given by this integral. Now the rest of it is a little bit of um, uh, algebraic analysis, which you can uh, carry out on your uh, rough piece of paper. It will take you 10 or 15 minutes to do that, or maybe another five if you make a careless mistake uh, on the way. And you can determine this quantity for unit incident flux, if you, that depends on how you normalize it. And this using the unitarity of the S matrix, which is just a statement of the conservation of flux, you can show that this excess density, which you require for Smith's interpretation of time delay, which is this psi star psi, the, this is the scattered uh, wave function density. So this turns out to be given by this expression. And this is what you can determine in about uh, 10 minutes of uh, rough work on, uh, uh, on a piece of paper. And if you evaluate this, then the result turns out to be this. All right. And notice that the Smith time delay is given in terms of all of these terms, which is the sum of these one, two, three, four, five terms on the right. But then uh, this term is minus 2r over v, which cancels this with a plus 2r over v. Then there is a g over r, which uh, vanishes in the asymptotic limit as r goes to infinity. And then you have a sinusoidal term. And when you carry out averages, then this, these oscillatory terms also cancel. And what you are left with is only one term on the right, which is exactly the same as we got from the analysis which we did using the eisenbord wigner formalism. In other words, the time delay in Smith's formulation is exactly the same as the time delay in the eisenbord wigner uh, formulation. And it reinforces the idea that yes, this is an important measurable quantity. Um, you can interpret it in different ways in the eisenbord wigner formalism or in the Smith formalism. And we often refer to it as a uh, uh, Wigner time delay, or uh, sometimes uh, to uh, explicitly give credit to the works of Eisenberg and Smith as WES uh, time delay. But then there is another formalism, which is of great importance, which I will um, introduce you to. This is the uh, formalism uh, developed by Amrain and Jauch. Jauch has a, a paper in 1972. It's a fairly old paper, but then it is uh, also available in a not so old book, Hilbert Space Methods in Quantum Mechanics by Amrain. 
uh, about a little more than 10 years ago. And uh, this talks about the time delay. We, uh, we commented earlier that there is no operator for time. So we talked about the, the similarity in the uncertainty principle, uh, delta Q, delta P, and how uh, we have a similar uncertainty relation between energy and time, delta E, delta T. But then I pointed out that you cannot derive that expression, you cannot obtain that expression for energy and time uncertainty using the same kind of analysis as you'll find in Sakurai's quantum mechanics for position and momentum. And the reason is there is no operator for time in quantum mechanics. Um, long back, uh, I forget, but maybe a few decades ago, I was trying to search for some literature um, on this work in the early, uh, in, during the early period of quantum mechanics. And I think that there are a few papers in the 1930s where there was some attempt to introduce an operator for time, but I think uh, subsequently it was abandoned or at least shelved. And uh, there is no operator for time in quantum mechanics. But then there is an operator for time delay, which is what we are talking about over here. And, and this is found in the work of Jauch in uh, 1972, and uh, you will find um, fairly detailed analysis in Amrain's book. So what they do is to interpret the scattering phenomenon in terms of these time evolution operators. And um, the, the solution for a free uh, wave packet and the solution for a uh, wave packet which is scattered by a target potential. We uh, are using the symbols phi and psi uh, respectively for the free packet and uh, psi for the scattered packet. So there is a superscript V not equal to zero here and a V equal to zero here. So both of these are time evolution operators. So they are, the, this is the time evolution operator with the Hamiltonian H, but the Hamiltonian is just the kinetic energy operator for the free particles, whereas it is T plus V when the scattering potential is actually present. So you have a unitary time evolution operator and the, you presume that in the infinite past and infinite future, uh, the scattered states from the scattered potential and the free particles would correspond to each other. And this analysis uh, allows you to express the scattered wave functions in terms of the free particle states using the Mueller operators, uh, which you would have met in, um, in your course on quantum collisions, uh, or maybe in Wu and Omura's book, or some other uh, book on quantum collisions. And you have the scattered solution, which are written in terms of these free particle states in and out as t goes to minus infinity and t goes to plus infinity. And these are the Mueller operators and you can have the free particle. I mean, this, this diagram is uh, very schematic and it tells you that if you have free particles, you, you just, these are represented by these straight lines. The scattered uh, solution is indicated by this blue line and you can go from this free particle states to the scattered states on using these Mueller operators. So this analysis is very straightforward because you get the scattered wave functions in terms of the Mueller operators omega plus and omega minus. And you can write, if you operate on this side by omega minus adjoint, uh, these are unitary operators and uh, they, they correspond to the um, S matrix, this uh, operator, the scattering operator. And if you do this analysis following the method which is described in Amrain's book, and that is something which some of you are going to work out, then you can come up with this interpretation of the excess time spent by the scattering state psi with respect to the evolution of the state corresponding to the free particle wave packets represented by phi. 
So Smith interpreted this in terms of the excess density, but this is a more direct uh, analysis in terms of the excess time. And this, uh, this analysis using the unitarity of the S matrix leads you to a, an operator, which is the time delay operator. It turns out to be minus I S dagger del S by del E and using the properties of the S matrix, you can show that this time delay operator is a Hermitian operator. And this is a very nice feature because um, as I mentioned earlier, all the early attempts to represent time by a Hermitian operator did not succeed. But here you have an operator for time delay, not for time, but for time delay. And this is a Hermitian operator, which tells us that corresponding to this Hermitian operator, uh, you now have an observable and time delay is an observable that you can actually measure. So this is a remarkable analysis. Uh, and we find that the scattering time delay, um, the analysis in terms of the Wigner Eisenberg uh, method, the Smith method, and perhaps the Amrain Jausch method. I don't know if it should be called as WES plus AJ, uh, this thing. But what I'm going to talk about is uh, the time delay, not in collisions, but in photo absorption. So there is a, temp a, a time delay in photo absorption processes as well, and we need to uh, come to terms with what exactly is the relationship between uh, quantum collisions and photo absorption. And this relation is also a very interesting one. And what is interesting is that um, experimentalists uh, have developed extremely high precision, very sophisticated technology like the rabbit method or the frog trap method and so on. And they are able to actually measure these time delays, uh, which are of the order of an autoseconds. This is amazing that such high precision measurements can now be carried out. And this is a great advancement in the last 20 years. Um, so hats off to the experimentalists, but this has also demanded uh, an, a theoretical analysis of this process using very sophisticated theoretical methods in quantum mechanics and relativistic quantum mechanics and many body theory. And uh, the time duration is really very short. It is like an autosecond is 10 to the minus 18 seconds. And if you look at the age of the universe, um, it is about, it is of the order of 10 to the 17 seconds. So an autosecond is a 10th of an inverse of the age of the universe. So that is how short a time duration we are talking about. And it is really um, amazing that such short durations are measured. And the experimental technology is very sophisticated. Uh, you are using uh, various uh, uh, pulse probe methods. Uh, I mean, the, the details of the technology um, is something which I will, um, I, I presume that some experimentalists will talk about uh, in the near future uh, on the ISAM platform. But the measurement requires using uh, the pump probe kind of technique at some level and the measurement itself introduces some additional delay. So this is a measurement induced uh, time delay, which is sometimes, sometimes called as the um, uh, continuum continuum uh, time delay or the Coulomb laser coupling and so on. So there are these additional complexities which come into uh, the actual comparison between uh, experimentally measured time delay and theoretically computed time delay. So I'm, my, my discussion today is focused on the collision part of the time delay, which is strictly the wigner eisenbot smith time delay, which is in this box. So so this is the part that uh, we, are, we are discussing. And as I mentioned, um, we, although we developed this formalism for collisions, I'm going to discuss it in the context of photoionization. And this requires a little bit of reconciliation with 
scattering theory to be interpreted appropriately because if you see if you have a collision experiment over here you, this is an electron beam which interacts with the target ion and let us say you have an electron ion uh, scattered state so you have an electron and an ion in the initial state and you have an electron in the and an ion in a final state it may be in an excited state which is indicated by an asterisk but at least the ingredients of the reaction are the same you have got an electron and an ion in both the initial and the final state but when you consider photoionization which is this left part of this diagram you do not even have a free electron uh, in the initial state instead we have a photon which is lost in the photo absorption process and what is kicked out in photoionization is an electron and what is left behind is an ion so in the final state you have an ion ionic core which is left and an electron which is a photoelectron which is kicked out so the final state of photo absorption or photoionization is the same as the final state of an electron ion scattering and this is what helps you use methods in collision physics in photoionization dynamics also although the ingredients of this reaction of the left are completely different from the ingredients of the scattering experiment on the right so the it is a final state which is similar the initial is not okay so it is for this reason that photoionization is sometimes called as half scattering and this half factor is something of importance uh, in our study of the um, time delay and these two processes these have a certain relationship with each other the relationship is quantitative it is quantum mechanical and uh, there is absolutely no classical analog for this because um, the final state is the same but the initial state is different it and it is not the same thing like we have in uh, for time reversal in classical physics uh, we, uh, the classical laws of physics are symmetric under time reversal whether it is hamilton's equations or newtons or whatever um, but in quantum theory you cannot do the time reversal the same way what happens is you you have in a collision process so just ignore this theta for the time being you have an incident wave packet and it gets scattered out whereas in a photoionization you do not have this type of there is nothing analogous of an incident wave packet all right instead what is incident is electromagnetic radiation it is a photon which is swallowed by the target in the photoionization experiment what comes out is an electron and this is what receives from the target in this half scattering experiment which i mentioned and if you look at this picture it tells you that there is a certain symmetry which is involved and this is the time reversal symmetry in quantum mechanics so this symmetry in quantum mechanics when you exploit this and write your wave function so you have the same schrodinger equation to solve except that the boundary conditions are different so you have to solve the differential equation subject to appropriate boundary conditions which in the for scattering which uh, most of you are familiar with uh, these are what is called um, as the outgoing wave boundary conditions i denoted by this superscript plus over here but in photoionization you make use of the ingoing wave boundary condition which i indicate by this minus sign on the top so the solutions are uh, obviously different and using this you can carry carry out an analysis using methods of quantum collision theory come back and use the wigner eisenbot smith formalism uh for for this and develop this idea of time delay in photoionization so when you determine the photoionization matrix element which is the transition probability amplitude from an initial state to a final state under this interaction which could be the dipole interaction it could be quadrupole or even higher uh, multipole but the final state must be described using ingoing wave boundary conditions as opposed to outgoing wave boundary conditions 
And like I mentioned, this is a very sophisticated uh, experimental, um, it, it demands very sophisticated experimental tools and uh, very sophisticated theoretical methods as well, which is uh, the use of relativistic many body uh, theories, which is what uh, my students and collaborators have developed a good amount of uh, experience with. And it can be used to study uh, photo ionization as well as photo detachment of uh, negative ions. And both have been studied in our group. And it allows us, this uh, time reversal symmetry allows us to use the wigner eisenwood smith formalism. The WES time delay is now represented by an expression which is similar to what you have in collision physics, except that you do not have this factor of two because photoionization is only half scattering, uh, related to scattering by uh, the time reversal symmetry, which I mentioned. So you need to determine this uh, phase, which is the uh, tan inverse of the imaginary part to the real part of the uh, photoionization uh, matrix element. And that is what gives you the time delay in photoionization. Of course, it is specific to every particular channel because you're determining this one at a time. And there may be a number of channels and nature does not uh, select these channels. All of these channels are present and it is for the theory to account for these, uh, all of these channels appropriately. That is what makes it impossible to use single particle methods. So the independent particle method or the single particle approximation or IPA as it is called, independent particle approximation really doesn't work. You need a many body theory. You cannot have exact solutions in a many body theory, but you have to develop approximations. And um, that is where the challenge is. And, um, you know, that there are certainly the approximation methods which have been developed have um, achieved a good bit of success, but not, it is impossible to get exact answers. So uh, many of the techniques that uh, my collaborators have used have centered around the random phase approximation in which case, in which you account for some of the correlations. There are a large number of correlations and it is impossible. It is literally impossible. There, there are existence theorems which tell you that it is impossible to get an exact solution to a many body problem. Having no body at all is already too many is how Professor Brown described the situation. So you have to make approximations and a very successful approximation in this context is a random phase approximation. We actually employ the relativistic random phase approximation so that all the correlations are built uh, not on the Hartree-Fock but on the dirac hartree fock on the dirac fock so starting with the Dirac equation. And uh, um, as, as we um, approach the last uh, part of this talk, I will uh, mention some uh, major achievements uh, of uh, this effort. Uh, one is the recognition of quantum confinement. And uh, when you study the photoionization, and, and here is a case of xenon trapped in C60 in fullerene. And this was one of our first works uh, by Ankur. And uh, uh, what we found is that the uh, cross sections and um, uh, you, you have these oscillations due to backscattering from the fullerene cage uh, when you have a xenon trapped in this. But this, we, we noticed that uh, the phase, or actually the energy derivative of the phase is an important element in the consideration of the time delay, but the phase also is of importance in determining the angular distribution of the photoelectrons. The photoelectrons which, are, which come out, which, eject, which are ejected after the photo absorption process, they do not come out in the same, uh, with the same uh, intensity in all the directions. And this is quantified in a parameter which is uh, called as angular distribution asymmetry parameter. And here in this figure, uh, actually there are two curves which are on top of each other. 
these are Ankur's calculation, and they tell you that uh, in in both the, um, uh, the these oscillations which you expect from the energy um, uh, from the quantum confinement are really not seen in the angular distribution. So if if angular distribution was the only parameter to to be used, then one might miss out on the features of quantum confinement. But when you study the time delay, uh, it pops up and you see these oscillations. So you see the signature of quantum confinement in um, studies on time delay, which is what makes time delay an important study. Here is another example which uh, highlights the importance of uh, time delay studies. Uh, this is a study in the giant resonance of manganese. And this is the uh, 3p uh, to 3d giant resonance in manganese. And here is a study of the time delay. And there are two sets of calculations over here. One is a blue calculation, which does not show this double hump. And the other is this red curve, which shows this double hump. And the difference between the two is that these weaker transitions, so this, this giant resonance is coming because of, because of the coupling between the 3P to D and the 3D to F channels. So it is this coupling, interchannel coupling, which is causing this resonance. And this is what one would uh, normally take into account. And while studying this, it would be tempting to ignore the, the D to P channels or also the P2S channels. So these are the relatively weak channels and one might be tempted to ignore them, but only when you include these channels, do you get this double hum and this would be seen. So we always see when we do many body theory that it is the more important channels which strongly influence the physics or the dynamics in the weaker channel. So here is a situation where you have the weaker channels influencing the dominant channels leading to a measurable effect. And it is measurable, not at the level of angular distribution of photoelectrons, because when you measure the angular distribution of photoelectrons is beta, it is the same in the two approximations. But when you measure the time delay, you have this double hum in, this, um, in, in, in one curve, which includes the weaker channels, and you miss out on that, when you uh, exclude the weaker channels. So this uh, tells the importance of time delay studies, um, not just the intensity, but the time delays are also angle dependent. And uh, Ankur did uh, some very nice work on this because when you determine the matrix elements, you have these spherical harmonics. And when you have a number of different channels, these interfere with each other, showing you strong angle dependence of the time delay. And this becomes accentuated um, in, the, uh, in the regions where the matrix elements are particularly sensitive to phenomena such as the Cooper minima, which uh, many of you would be familiar with, but I will not discuss it in uh, today's talk. Uh, there are uh, other situations which are of importance, particularly uh, just like there are um, interests in the region of the Cooper minima, there are interests in the region of resonances and there are two kinds of resonances, the shape resonances because of the centrifugal potential, for example, and then there are the flashback uh, type uh, resonances or the auto ionization resonances in photo ionization. And uh, we studied both of these and uh, both, uh, uh, both involve some challenges. Uh, there are um, the, the challenge in uh, uh, studying this, um, the shape resonance effect is that the Coulomb phase shift is so strong that it sort of swipes, it, it overrides everything else. And uh, Samajit was able to get around it by studying photo detachment because now the escaping electron leaves in the field of a neutral atom. So he avoids the Coulomb uh, phase shift and he has observed uh, 
um, dominant um, effects of the shape resonance in this phenomena. So I'm coming toward the end of this talk, just a few more slides. Uh, Saurav and Ashish have studied um, in autoinization resonances. So uh, most of you may be familiar with uh, uh, Fano's analysis, parametrization of autoinization resonances uh, because of the coupling between the bound to bound and bound to continuum channels. And uh, uh, in particular, we have studied the 2S to NP resonances in neon and also in the neon um, isoelectronic sequence. And here again, we have found that there is a strong dependence on energy as well as on angle in the neighborhood of Fano resonances. So this is again a very interesting study uh, which has been carried out by Saurav uh, on the 2S uh, 3P resonance. Uh, there are Interesting effects of um, spin orbit interaction activated interchannel coupling or SOAC as it is sometimes called SOI AIC spin orbit inter uh, interaction activated interchannel coupling. It is a tongue twister. <laughs> and here you notice that uh, whether or not you take this coupling into account has got uh, measurable impact on the time delay. So uh, this is the Xenon 3D uh, five half time delay figure, which is uh, shown over here. And um, like I mentioned, uh, correlations are not easy to take into account. Uh, you try different uh, ways of taking into account correlations. RPA is one of the very successful ones, but that's not the only one. There are many other ways of taking into account correlations. So we have also experimented with some other approximations uh, taking into account co-relaxation. Uh, the it's called as RRPA with relaxation. Uh, there is also this other, um, other method, which is the multi-configurational cam Dankoff technique. In which case, you take into account the configuration interaction uh, using explicit uh, CI configuration interaction using this brass code, and um, we have noticed that it has got uh, very dramatic effect and here in this study, recent study of uh, Xenon near the second Cooper minimum, uh, RP and Saurav found that in the RPA you get a large uh, positive uh, time delay whereas in MCTD you actually have a negative time delay. So, so these are the things which will help you, uh, measurements will be able to help us uh, determine which correlations are important. And there has been excellent work in the last two decades all over the world. Um, and I have not attempted a review of that work over here, but just to give you a flavor of what this wigner eisenbot smith time delay is about in collision physics and in photoionization. And for the community here in the Indian Society of Atomic and Molecular Physics, I believe we have great opportunities and Tremendous talent. So I've mentioned some of the other scientists in India who are working on um, ultra-fast uh, processes, uh, not necessarily on the measurement of time delay in photoionization, but they are also working with um, ultra-fast atomic uh, dynamics. Uh, so we have work going all the way from north to south and from east to west. And there are a number of uh, young scientists and I'm sure that in the days and uh, months and years to follow, we are going to hear from them. So thank you very much. I will be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Deshmukh. Those who want to ask questions can please type their name in the message window so that we can call them one by one for questions or you can raise your hand on the message window. <laughs> so there is a question. Gopal Dixit has some questions for you. Yes. Gopal, can you unmute yourself and ask? Yes, now I have unmuted. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Yes, Gopal, go ahead. So you have included so many channels and uh, putting the relativistic effect and all uh, sophistication with your calculation. 
Yes. Uh, have you ever compared any of your calculated results with the major data? For example, yeah. argon, arginine, and whether uh, these uh, interchannel coupling and uh, all the uh, relative stick effect make any sense to them or to the major yeah. data? Yeah, there are some comparisons and these are uh, available in our publications in a few cases. So I have not uh, reviewed all of them. Um, and uh, certainly the exclusion of the Coulomb laser coupling is, uh, is an issue that we have not uh, dealt with successfully. But in many cases we get uh, results which are pretty close. In fact, there is uh, the, the first measurement on neon, which was the difference in the uh, time delay between um, uh, in, in the ne neon to, uh, studies. Uh, so these uh, calculations have been repeated recently and I think that work we have not published as yet. Uh, Arti has done these calculations and we will be publishing it very soon. How much? Uh, well, they are very good. In this case, they are the, this neon case is very good. So uh, I'll because share. Later you. they have agreed that their uh, measurement was wrong actually. This is a yes. CQS. Yes. Yes. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and it is the later measurement with which we have made our comparison. So I'll share these results um, in a correspondence with you. Yeah, because I don't see, I mean, till now, with my best of knowledge, no one has claimed that relativistic all the uh, calculation will make any sense. Now I have a clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, the book that you have showed, this 2009 book, which talk about the operator for the time delay. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have not read this book, but I'm sure they don't talk about the time delay in photoionization. No. Because they don't know how to write the total tau as a tau Wigner plus tau CLC. Right. How this linear operator things came out because there is no operator for the time delay. No, no. They, they, this operator corresponds only to the atomic scattering time delay and not to the Coulomb laser part. No, no, they don't know anything about, I mean, the whole concept of the photoionization time delay was introduced in 2010 by Vladimir Yokolo PRL paper. Later on, they have measured the science paper in 2010. Mm -hmm. So they don't know anything about this one. There is a very nice article review by uh, Alfred Mackie, who is a real uh, uh, expertise in all autosecond physics in 2014, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. talks about time and quantum mechanics and autosecond. It's a tutorial paper for basically for the undergrad and Yes. Uh, article. So, sure. so uh, there is no concept. I mean, all the community has a common consensus that there is no operator. It's only so depends on how you are measuring. If you are measuring by rabbit, you are measuring the phases, and if you are measuring by streaking, you are measuring how much electron has shifted from. See, all the all the physical information is contained in the phases and how these phases change with energy. Streaking does not measure the phases. No, streaking streaking is not measuring the phases, but it is measuring the time delay of the wave packet. It is only measuring how the shift is happening in presence of IR field. Yeah, absolutely. So this is not a time delay. No, no, no but that's not the only component. There are two and, 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 let, and, and let me put another thing. I mean, just to make uh, things clear. If it is an operator, you don't need to have a relative measurement. Why always measure two relative things? Like we have a uh, dipole moment. You can measure it. You don't need to measure relative things. See, look here. Uh, let's not get into other things. So far as the time delay is concerned, the scattering time delay is what this operator stands for. And for that, there is a Hermitian operator, which is what I pointed out. There is no Hermitian operator, which I am aware of, which includes a time delay due to both scattering as well as the Coulomb laser coupling, uh, which, uh, which is introduced in the measurement process. So what the measurement process measures certainly is the time delay due to the measurement, but that is not the only contributor to the time delay. There is a significant and a um, significant part which is introduced in the scattering process itself, which has nothing to do with the measurement. And Thank that, you, Professor Deshmukh. I think maybe we can discuss it later. Yeah. There are two questions. Uh, there are further people waiting for ask questions. Shubhadeep Biswas first and then Shiva Ramakrishna. 
Subhadi. Uh, hi. So can you hear me? Yes, I do. Uh, yeah, okay. So I have a follow-up question from uh, maybe uh, Gopal. So uh, you talked about the relativistic effects. So mm -hmm. what kind of effect do you, do you expect if you have um, some relativistic uh, dynamics going on? Actually, this question is quite important because so right now we are moving from this higher harmonic generation based uh, attosecond physics to like LCLS where you can you can probe this kind of relativistic effect. So yes. I, I'll just ask uh, you what kind of specific effect do you expect other for from this uh, relativistic effect? Well, relativistic effects can be quite important because um, you know even at low fairly low energies um, see by and large when you're looking at background properties it may not be very important but close to phenomena such as at the Cooper minimum or resonances the relativistic effects can become quite significant because you may have uh, one of the relativistic channels means relativistically you always have more channels than what you have in the non-relativistic uh, spectroscopy so you may have a Cooper minimum, one of the, one of the channel, the non-relativistic channel could be going through a zero, but then you have a relativistic channel which does not have a zero at the same energy because of these matrix elements are energy dependent. They may have their Cooper minima at different points and these will lead to measurable effects. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, relativistic effect has nothing to do with the Cooper Vina. We have a paper 2013 where we have done non-relativistic effect calculation in the time delay before your paper came out. And we reproduce Cooper Vina in argon as it is without fair relativistic effect. This is pretty DFT okay. calculation. Fair, fair enough. But in th um, uh, the relativistic Cooper minima in the different relativistic channels may or may not occur at exactly the same energy. And the specific uh, result is something that we can discuss. In some case, it may not have an important effect, but sure enough, there are a number of situations where the Cooper minima in the different relativistic channels do not occur at the same energy. Uh, there are, they are also sensitive to the shape, uh, but, uh, shape resonance uh, in, in the higher Z atoms, for example, in the photoionization of uh, um, uh, mercury, we have studied this. Uh, and what happens is that uh, there are important relativistic effects which are exaggerated due to the shape resonance. But uh, we, we can discuss that separately. All right. Thank you, uh, Professor Deshmukh. Shiva now. Shiva <coughs> Hi, uh, am I audible? Yes, Shiva. Yeah, hi. So, uh, just a sh quick comment uh, before my question. Uh, what I wanted to say is that um, these calculations would be uh, difficult to compare with the actual measured values in the experiment because the electron continues to interact with various yes. fields uh, in, in, the, in the experiment. Of course, there's the laser field, but also uh, maybe other uh, fields uh, which are not which are unavoidable in the experiment. This mm -hmm. possibly has been one of the reasons why it took so many iterations between experiment and theory to converge to some sort of uh, agreement. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but then, uh, what sort of fascinated me uh, in this whole saga is that actually uh, an author of Indian origin he did a very nice experiment on atomic hydrogen. Uh, which finally, in my opinion, gives a very good uh, test bed for comparing uh, theory and experiment, of course, without these complexities like the relativistic effects and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but my question is um, to you uh, and possibly other uh, theorists in the field is, have you considered working with negative ions? Because they are probably another very good candidate where you have one electron really to deal with predominantly and all the others are not so active uh, within quotes. Uh, if so, uh, what is uh, your impression? If not, uh, are there challenges in theory to consider uh, such a, a scenario? Yeah, so uh, Sh Shiva, um, what uh, attracted us to the negative ions um, is the uh, huge effect which the Coulomb field 
of the residual positive ion in atomic photoionization has on the escaping photoelectron. And that, that experiences a strong Coulomb field and um, that makes it very difficult to study effects such as those of shape resonance. And that is a problem which Somajit uh, addressed. So Somajit determined, Somajit and Jobin was also involved in that work and what they did was to study uh, time delay in photo detachment of negative ions. And um, I showed one result, but uh, there are other results which we can discuss um, in, in, in a follow-up meeting. Um, so one uh, important thing which came out of it was the effect which shape resonance has on uh, the time delay, which was otherwise very difficult to study in the case of photoionization because of the Coulomb field would swamp it. But in photo detachment, the escaping electron, the photo detached electron, it escapes in the field of a neutral atom. And uh, then it is free from the uh, Coulomb interaction. So that, that has helped us study some of the other um, the contributors to the interaction, in particular, the shape resonance, the, the centrifugal barrier potential effects. Yeah, uh, thank you, Pranav. But uh, also there was a correction from Gopal, the experiment I mentioned with atomic hydrogen is tunneling time and not time delay. So that, of course, is true. Uh, yeah, but of course the interest in negative uh, in a negative ion system. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I, I discussed it in the context of the photo detachment. Okay, yes. next, Jobin Jos, please. Yeah, am I audible, sir? Yes, Jobin. Yeah, sir. My question is uh, from an experimental perspective. Uh, so we know uh, photoionization is half scattering. That's why in the scattering time delay, there is a factor of two coming or in mm -hmm. the vice versa. In the photoionization, we don't have the two. So mm -hmm. from an experimental perspective, let's say if I have on one side a scattering of an electron from a positive ion and on the other side, I have a photoionization experiment. Now, if I measure the uh, time delay uh, from the both uh, experiments, Will it be just the half of the other? From the theoretical uh, considerations, we don't really, I, I don't know, if it becomes really half, then it's kind of uh, uh, definitely I feel it's a miracle. But from the theoretical consideration, it doesn't uh, appear to be, um, I don't know, it's very complicated if they both become exactly half. Well, I, I don't even know if uh, this type of an experiment has actually been done for, and, uh, for actual comparison. Um, okay. So uh, I I don't know, but um, uh, see, all this will work if you when you compare experiments. All this will work only if you are dealing with single particles. When when you okay. have uh, many other things going on simultaneously, uh, there are other contributors to the net result that you will actually measure. Okay. And uh, I think it will be very difficult to uh, include all of those uh, effects. Okay. So. So, okay, if there are no more questions, we would thank everybody for attending. There were about 76 people throughout and there are still 76 people around. I would like to thank everybody and uh, especially thank Professor Deshmukh for an interesting talk. The next one will be by Professor E. Krishna Kumar. It will be an experimental talk to keep a little bit of balance and let us thank Dr. Deshmukh again. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Safan. Thanks. Thanks for everybody.